Marino, uh, has, as usual, requested I not say a lot about him uh, for purpose of time. Uh, I will just say a few things that aren't in the biblio, uh, such as that he's written about 400 articles, uh, uh, 12 books that he's authored or co-authored, and perhaps more significantly in a certain way has over 40 honorary degrees. It is a particular privilege to introduce Ed to discuss this topic because he has, since the school's been around, uh, every year come here to speak with the students about ethics of being a medical student. Um, toward this particular approach, I must add that I think Ed is known in the bioethics community for starting from the, the notion that patients are particularly vulnerable, a topic that we addressed this morning, and then drawn the conclusions of what is required on the part of care providers as a result of that vulnerability. So toward this topic, I can't think of anyone better suited to address us than Dr. Pellegrino. Thank you very much, Randy. You're probably wondering how I came to be chosen to s discuss this subject. My experiences in the military were rather brief during World War II, not one, although I look like one, but <laughs> World War II, <laughs> when it was the U.S. Army Air Corps. And uh, so that goes back quite a way. Uh, but I've never participated in this kind of research. But I am here, I think, as a result of uh, a number of indiscretions that came together one afternoon uh, right here on this campus. First, I made the mistake of uh, accepting an invitation to lunch before the lecture I often give here once a year on, uh, as you heard, uh, the relationships of students and the ethics of being a student. During that lunch, uh, Randy asked me a question, and I was foolish enough to respond to the question with my usual degree of certitude that I was absolutely right and there were no possible uh, opposing positions. As a consequence of that, I also made the additional error of referring to two papers I've written on this subject, but not really on, quite on this subject, but two, one on moral complicity and the other on uh, the responsibilities of physicians in dealing with the question of nuclear war. So here I am. Uh, the victim of my own vanity, and I hope I can discuss the subject at least in a very general way for you. Uh, the time is limited, and I have to therefore condense what I'm saying. I have only one saving possibility here, and that is that Ruth has suggested uh, that there be no questions after I talk. Whether that's to protect me or you, I don't know. <laughs> and I'll leave that to you to judge. I'm going to address four issues. First, a brief historical note that this is not a new problem. You probably know that. But some of the names might interest you uh, who have been involved in, <clears throat> in this question of whether or not one can put medical knowledge into the service of something other than the healing and helping of patients. The second issue I want to talk about is something that would quickly summarize the reasons for and against participation. The third would be a notion or two about moral complicity and how you might apply some of the elements of a doctrine of moral complicity to the decision. And then lastly, the conditions under which I think it might be permissible to engage in this kind of research. So four major issues. I'll keep my eye on the clock. And so if there's a little irregularity in my presentation, you'll understand that I'm condensing as the time goes by so that I don't uh, keep you off track. Getting back on track is more important than hearing what I have to say, I assure you. First of all, it is an old question. And some people have put their scientific or medical knowledge to the use uh, of patriotism or their own countries. Archimedes, Galileo, Leonardo, you'll see the beautiful tank that he uh, designed, and uh, Dr. Fritz Haber, who received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for ammonia synthesis and then went on to develop poison gas for his company, uh, country, excuse me, Fermi, Zillard, 
Einstein, Oppenheimer, the atomic bomb, Dr. Guillotine, who developed a merciful way of uh, executing people during the re revolution, the French Revolution. He was a physician. Uh, he put his medical knowledge to work uh, by showing that it was a much more rapid and easy death if one were, had it done quickly. Uh, on the other hand, there were those who refused. Michael Faraday would not participate in the development of poison gas because he said it would advance the cause of war. Uh, British scientists after World War I, uh, as a group, uh, protested the use of, of medical knowledge and physicians in any research related to warfare. The protesters during the Vietnam War, with whom many of you are familiar, and then the very ambiguous case of Hippocrates himself, uh, who was asked by the Persian emperor Artaxerxes uh, to come to Persia to help with an epidemic. And uh, he said, no, uh, you are enemies of the Greeks, and I'm not going to put my knowledge at your service. And one could interpret that both ways. One is a noble uh, defense of his own people. On the other hand, in some ways, a violation of the own Hippocratic uh, dedication to the idea of beneficence and helping when you have knowledge and making it available to other people. So the past is a mixed bag. And we have had statements pro and con. Let me move to the second point I want to make, since we don't have precedent that's strong one way or the other. What are some of the reasons for involvement, and what are some of the reasons against it. The questions that I want to flow from this will be, is participation in the development of lethal weapons consistent with medical ethics? Could it be? And does it make a difference if one is a military physician or not? We'll come to that at the very end. The arguments in favor of it. One, is the argument taken by many scientists that science is in the search of truth. The scientist should not be concerned about what is done with the truth and that his or her contribution must be good science and public policy will determine how it is to be used. A second argument is it is the physician has a duty and a responsibility to help in protecting his fellow human beings, indeed, as a member and a citizen of a country with special knowledge, he has a responsibility to make that knowledge available in his country's well-being. Physician participation would make a third reason, make the weapon to be developed as humane as possible, could reduce the severity of the damage, and could bring about a quicker death, and therefore, by definition, a merciful death, presumably. Furthermore, there is such a thing as a just war, and therefore, under the cloak of the just war, one would be justified in participating in such research. A fourth reason, without physician participation, others would do it anyway, and they wouldn't have the restraining effect of medical ethics. And then finally, the enemy would do it in any case, so why shouldn't we? Now, those are the arguments in favor. The arguments against are these. The ends of medicine are helping, healing, caring, and curing. That distinguishes medicine as a profession, has always distinguished those physicians who were something more than businessmen or craftsmen, and therefore their concern should be for the beneficent care and welfare of all human beings. To develop or to help develop Instruments of death, injury, or mayhem is simply inconsistent with what medicine is all about. That's an ethical response from the point of view of an ethos, a particular point of view on what is right and wrong, peculiar to what it is to be a physician and a nurse, I would say, as well. A second reason against it would be that even if good were to come out of this kind of participation, survival, for example, it's not justifiable to do evil that good may come from it. The issue of justification of killing and self-defense is already out of hand in the minds of many people, and to make killing more efficient and make one able to kill more people is to exceed the limits 
that are morally defensible even under a doctrine of self-defense. A third reason against it is that physician refusal, the refusal of healthcare professionals to serve is an ethical warning signal, a beacon, so to speak, that there are limits to the human tendency for killing. We live in the bloodiest century the world has ever known. We all know that. More people have been killed in this century than in any previous century, all of them put together. And so the question then is whether we should participate in forwarding that particular disability of our century. And the possibility, therefore, that the world's physicians and other health professionals were to stand together and oppose this kind of participation, they would somehow change this tendency for homicide uh, in the human race all too frequently expressed. A fourth reason against it is the personal complicity of the physician in the evil of killing and the betrayal of the ideals of medicine, but not only that, one's own personal ideals. And then the final, that the military physician, is she or he a special case? Well, those are the reasons on both sides. Now, how would you approach the resolution of that particular set of arguments, which in some sense tend to balance each other out? And doesn't that always happen when you develop the pro and con? So I'd like to say a word or two about what I think is the moral doctrine that would apply, at least for me, in helping me to make that resolution. And it's the doctrine of what's called moral complicity or cooperation. We know that we live in a world in which we cannot avoid some degree of contact with activities which we find to be morally offensive. This is a pluralistic society, and uh, all of us, in one way or another, may find ourselves either on an IRB, at some distance perhaps, or at the bedside uh, in a clinical investigative project, or involved with something that at some point may lead to the development of a lethal weapon. So the question comes up, how do we discern in these circumstances whether or not our involvement is sufficiently close to the moral evil, if you will, to the moral harm, and one can't deny that whatever justification one uses, when one develops a lethal weapon, the aim is harming, mayhem, killing of other people. Leaving aside the justifications or the arguments for or against, that's simply a statement of fact. So how could one, how can one justify this? Because it is understood that in this world, the way it is, we may well be involved at some relationship to acts for which we are morally accountable. And the question is, how accountable are we uh, in an act which is morally dubious or morally wrong. I'm not assuming it is wrong. That's simply saying there are things we can become involved in. Now, ordinarily, and I'm watching the clock again, under this particular doctrine of complicity and cooperation, how do we determine it, moral distance is usually measured by the degree of sharing of the intention to do harm by the status of the act in question, this is abstract for the moment, I'm going to make it concrete very shortly, by the degree of harm being done by the act, by the degree of necessity of our participation for bringing about that particular act, the attainment of the harmful end, and the proportionality, that is to say, the balance between the harm that's done and the potential benefit that might be done. I could give you uh, a number of examples. Uh, let me give you one example of the kind of cooperation one might be found uh, in ordinary daily life, leaving aside for the moment the uh, lethal uh, instrument uh, for the second, simply to use a particular case. Let us say that one happens to be a uh, Roman Catholic nurse for whom a uh, sterilization is an improper procedure. 
in the midst of an operation which was not set out to be a sterilization procedure, a surgeon decides that this is medically indicated, that nurse is assisting, she would be participating in something that she thinks to be wrong, which is, from her point of view, intrinsically wrong. Nonetheless, her participation, determined by the various criteria I gave you, would consider to be an acceptable kind of participation. Why? Because, A, she's not sharing the intent, she didn't start out with an intent. B, her cooperation is what we call material, that is to say, yes, she is actively helping, but if she were to abandon that patient, she would produce a very, very great harm, and so the proportionality would be one that would be in favor of continuing. She would have a responsibility not to get in that situation again, but under those circumstances, that would be a degree of com moral complicity which would be acceptable. So if you were to take that kind of an example and those particular criteria, you might set forth a series of questions that one would ask when one faces the possibility of participating in the development of a lethal weapon, let us say in germ warfare or chemical warfare. First, asking this question to determine, one, how great is the moral distance the moral distance between what is wrong intrinsically or what you consider to be wrong and yourself and your act and your decision. Is the action a good action in itself? Is it wrong or is it morally indifferent from the point of view of now medical ethics? Now we're moving to what are the responsibilities of physicians as physicians. And the measure there would be, is it consistent with our primary distinguishing obligation, which is to the welfare of the person who is ill, who is vulnerable, who is dependent, or to any person we encounter acting from beneficence and non-maleficence. Second, to what degree do we share the harmful intention? One could be involved in research. One could be involved in research which was going to lead to a lethal development of an instrument and not share the intention. Now, none of these by themselves will excuse. I'm not setting up a algorithm for excuse. I'm setting up an algorithm for a series of questions the calculus of which, that is to say, the putting together of those would bring you to your conclusion. Because I'm going to close uh, with suggestions of the conditions under which would, it would be licit and those in which it would not be. But to what degree do we share the harmful intention? How essential is our cooperation? Is it so essential that without our cooperation in every step it couldn't come about? Or is our cooperation distal? Are we doing a small piece of the operation which is very far removed and could be done without? What is the causal relationship between our action as physicians and the harm? Is it direct or is it indirect? Is there a proportional good reason to justify distant cooperation? And then finally, if we are physicians, is the act consistent with the ethical ends of medicine, which I've defined? Now, I would submit that that applies whether one is a military physician or not. A physician, uh, in my view at least, is a physician. That means, therefore, that military duty per se does not constitute medically morally mandatory duty. I realize that creates problems, but I'm trying to give you one form of analysis of the issue. Now let's take some of that, again because the time is rapid, I have to move fast. Under what conditions, if we use those criteria, might participation be morally defensible? If we use these guiding principles of the ethics of cooperation, which I have woefully, superficially gone over for you, but for those who are interested, there is a full-blown development of this notion.
It is in one or two of these papers I have developed in more extension. First of all, I think, <clears throat> at least in the few papers that are in the literature on this subject, a distinction is made between a defensive and an offensive use of the instrument in question. For an example, preparation of a vaccine to defend oneself against a known or a probable organism the enemy might use in <clears throat> biological warfare would be a defensive action. The same would be true in chemical warfare if we knew of a toxin that would be used or a probable toxin and we could develop the antidote to that toxin. Here, this is fully consistent with the ends of medicine. It's a beneficent end, it's helping people, it's ameliorating a harm, and it is preventing our own troops as well as our civilians and other human beings and the enemy, as a matter of fact, when we capture them, from harm. If these measures are used, then I think we are dealing with a defensive use. The intention is not to harm. The intention is not to involve non-combatants. The intention is a good one, and therefore one would have a duty, as a matter of fact, to participate so that one could prepare for an expected and probable assault. Second, there would have to be no participation in the development of the delivery system for the bacteria or the chemicals. I'm using these two examples or making the organisms, for example, more virulent, or make them such that they would spread more rapidly, or make them in larger quantities, because quite obviously there, the intention is not helping those who are assaulted by these, but rather to prepare larger numbers of these uh, noxious agents, chemical or bacterial, and obviously offense is the aim so the participation in offensive uh, research. A third is the obligation, these are conditions under which it would be listed, to participate in the strategy formation, information, education, for defense against. There are many other ways one can defend beside the antidote and the vaccine the development of diagnostic agents, of sensing agents that would pick up the uh, noxious agent, decontamination, and warning of the public. Those would be valid participations. I'm pointing these out because some have said right from the beginning even this kind of participation would not be valid. I would disagree with them. Whenever possible, the research ought to be, of, if it satisfied those criteria, conducted on neutral ground. The information should be shared. I understand the problems in warfare. And even if the enemy can get this information and use it, this might put a stop to the escalation of the response when the enemy finds out that we are preparing a vaccine against Agent A. They can certainly assume that we might use it in a preemptive strike and therefore they will uh, develop organism B or develop a vaccine to organism A. The whole thing begins to accelerate and goes out. There are different strategies uh, and intentions from the very beginning of a defensive versus an offensive use of a lethal weapon, therefore, and one can therefore examine to the extent one can predict where you are in the process of development. Once you begin to diverge from the protection of troops or personnel of any kind to the delivery system, to the exaggeration and the increasing of the toxicity or the lethality of the agent, one begins to get to the point when participation becomes not acceptable. Let's take a uh, little harder cases. What about the development of a weapon that might incapacitate a person? Incapacitate, let's say, from the point of view of running them not able to see, let us say, or using paralytic agents and so on. <clears throat> 
Would that be preferable? Could you do that? Because after all, you would say that would prevent maiming. The person would be intact. They would at least be able to survive. Then one has to ask the question, does one prefer, let us say, blindness or paralysis that might be permanent to death? Who is to make that decision? I would think that would be a dubious, borderline case, and for myself would be very, very dubious about the uh, ethical nature of participation. I wrote a paper some years ago on the participation of physicians in preparing for defense against nuclear warfare. I favored that. I said it was legitimate. Most of the people writing in the same volume were opposed to it. Their argument was that any, any participation by a physician was blessing of the whole idea of nuclear war, that it would lead people to believe that one could survive such an attack, uh, that it would lead the enemy to believe that you are preparing to attack them and therefore would lead them to a preemptive strike. I don't think I can find my way through that particular Byzantine pro and con back and forth uh, presupposition of whose intentions are for doing what. Uh, but I did feel that if we did not participate in the development of the weapon, the offensive part, even if we were mad enough, God knows we have not been so far, to initiate an atomic attack, we should do everything we possibly can as a physician to deal with what I would call the stupidity of mankind. Nonetheless, we physicians are not moralists. We don't make those judgments. Uh, certainly not as physicians. We would care for those who are injured. There are some who would defend a rejection of this offensive-defensive distinction. And they say it only encourages injury, gives medical legitimacy, militarizes science and biology, makes war more horrible to contemplate if we physicians don't do anything about it at all. That was the British point of view, and so horrible to contemplate that therefore the enemy wouldn't participate in it. Uh, again, you can judge the reality of that kind of a response. I don't particularly agree with that. Finally, I think the determinant really is going to be the character of the investigator, whether that investigator has the courage to stand for these fine distinctions based on what medicine is about, whether that person will detect early what the development of the weapons or for whether he or she will inquire sufficiently to know what the intent is and so on. I believe there's a responsibility to do so. I've just used up almost all of my time except five minutes. I apologize for the rapidity, but I didn't want to be here making these apodictic statements with such rapidity without giving you at least five minutes to challenge, to comment, to question, and to get back at me. Uh, I enjoy debate, and I didn't want to deprive myself of the debate. Let me just summarize by saying that there are strong reasons for and against participation that I think if one looks at the doctrine or the ethics of participation and complicity in acts which are questionable or immoral, one can dissect one's way through these particular circumstances. I've only given you a quick examples because of the time lack. But I think one can approach this reasonably and rationally, and my conclusion is that there are circumstances under which one might participate and others under which we which be totally unacceptable. Thank you. Up there, please. Yes, sir. Um, part of our oath. If you make your question on the point, I can respond quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, 
We are not always in the business anymore in the military of defending the country against other uniformed opponents. Yes. Uh, do the moralities change in hostage situations? If we're being asked to conduct research where we might be able to um, incapacitate our domestic enemies that are holding hostages? I, I don't know if I'm making sense here. Yeah, well, I, I think you're uh, domestic enemy. You mean terrorists. Yes, right? sir. Yeah. yeah. I, but given a hostage situation, yeah. uh, generally yeah. Uh, yeah. The military opponents don't take hostages and hold them against us. But the military is being asked to conduct and consider that research. Well, I, th I think it makes no difference what, 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 whether it's an enemy or a hostage. Same rules for uh, cooperation would apply, in my view. Okay. Having spent my military career in uh, medical defense against biological and chemical and infectious diseases, I appreciate your comments. But I have heard it said that, in fact, no military research, be it de offensive or defensive, is defensible because by uh, doing defensive research and creating vaccines and drugs which will protect us, it makes, us, makes it possible for us to use those weapons against our enemies yes. because we're protected. And I'm wondering what your yeah, well, that was one, comment is. That was is one of the arguments. I, I, would, I would reject that argument. Uh, based upon? Ba based on the fact that I think that it is consistent with, with uh, the ends of medicine uh, to protect people against possible attack, that if we did not develop those toxins and bacteria and expand them, et cetera, et cetera, but use it particularly for protection of people, I think that would be justifiable. That the enemy would construe it that way is, I think, one of those things we used to call in medieval philosophy the futurabilia, the things that could be, might be, would happen under certain circumstances, but perhaps never will be. And so that's just too much of an effort on my part or anybody else's part to play this chess game of back and forth. I think here we're dealing with an immediate threat and a threat, <clears throat> and we have an also a good moral rule if you deal with the immediate threat rather than the ones way down the line that you can't see. So here we'd be dealing with, I would presume, a probable, serious, grave harm to identifiable people and therefore, I think you have a moral responsibility, uh, whether you're a military physician or not. Bob, is it too late to ask a question? When, why don't we take Well, if it's a tough question, Bob, yeah, it's too late. <laughs> Ed, your analysis, Ed, <clears throat> assumes that a physician is always a physician 24 hours a day. Uh, some other analyses would say a physician is bound by the ethics of medicine when interacting with patients but on his or her own time could do other things. Like many people with MD degrees spend a lot of time doing molecular biology. Uh, do the ethics of the doctor-patient relationship apply when you're doing molecular biology? Only if you're dealing with a patient. But if you're developing vaccines, yeah. you're not dealing with the patient. Yes. You're dealing well, with a lot of healthy human beings out there hoping to Keep them healthy. Yes, yeah. But one of, one of the aims of medicine, surely, has always been from the very beginning, uh, not only not only to heal and help and cure and care, but also to cultivate health and to prevent illness. Uh, that's in Hippocrates on the art. So that would be consistent. And certainly, uh, I might one thing I'd like to comment on, the physician or the nurse is a nurse, even when out of a specific phys physician-patient relationship, but if you pass by someone, we have something that goes beyond the rule of non-maleficence. It's the rule of beneficence. And that everyone else doesn't have that. Legally, you can walk by somebody who's drowning. Uh, but from the point of view of medical ethics, I can't walk by someone who's bleeding. I guess that does it. Thank you very, very much. Sorry for to be so fast. <laughs> <laughs>
Often as I have traveled around to different human subjects meetings around the country over the last four years, I've had people come up to me from the civilian community and ask, why is the Army doing medical research? And I enjoy it when they ask me that question because then I get an opportunity to talk about the fact that one of the major areas of research that we do is in an international setting looking at infectious diseases. We send, as a part of their duty, soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen and airwomen all over the world to places where there are endemic diseases. Part of our duty is to make sure that those military warfighters can maintain their health and so that they can return healthy back to the United States. In that sense, the research we do on endemic diseases around the world is protecting the civilian community back home so we're not bringing endemic diseases back to Iowa, Florida, Kansas, or wherever we came from when we come home on leave to visit our families. Another reason why the military does this research is because the pharmaceutical industry doesn't have a financial incentive to discover a cure for a disease in the, in the middle of Africa. If they did discover a cure for a certain disease, the country may be too poor to even purchase that product. So in that sense, we do a lot of advantage, not only for our sailors, our soldiers, our air persons, men and women, get the politically correct terms here, but it's for the whole United States. And I'd like today to uh, briefly introduce the panel. The first person I will introduce, and then I'll let them speak, then I'll introduce the next person. They can speak, and then the next person. And first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Levine. Robert J. Levine is a professor of medicine and lecturer in pharmacology at Yale University School of Medicine and chairperson of the Institutional Review Board at Yale New Haven Medical Center. He is a fellow of the Hastings Center the American College of Physicians, and the American Association of the Advancement of Science, a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and American Society of Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics, immediate past president of the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics, and past chairman of the Connecticut Humanities Council. Dr. Levine, former editor of Clinical Research, is the current editor of IRB, a review of human subjects research, and has served as consultant to several federal and international agencies involved in the development of policy for the protection of human subjects. He is the author of numerous publications and is currently preparing a third edition of his book, Ethics and Regulation of Clinical Research. His recent activities include chairman of the steering committee for revision of the CIOMS WHO International Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical Research Involving Human Subjects. He is a member of the AIDS Program Advisory Committee, NIH, and the chairman of its subcommittee, the National Human Subjects Protections Review Panel. Today, Dr. Levine will talk about the research conducted by investigators from developed countries on subjects who are residents of developing countries. We'll also explain how responsibilities for ethical review may be apportioned to committees in the sponsoring countries and committees in the host country. It's a great privilege for me to introduce Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that all too generous introduction. I would like to uh, uh, say that I, I pronounce my name Levine, but uh, thank you very much. <laughs> South Dakota accent. South Dakota accent? Yeah. Uh, I'm very pleased to be invited here today to discuss this topic. Uh, the topic of international research ethics has been a matter of great interest to me and to a small number of my colleagues for quite a long time. It was about six years ago that the American public and its policymakers <clears throat> began to share this interest in the ethical and practical problems presented by international research. Can I have the first slide, please? Or is this something I can do myself? No. <laughs> 
Oh, I already had it. In the autumn of 1991, newspapers around the world reported that four countries had been identified as likely sites for the initial trials of candidate HIV prevention vaccines. And these countries were Rwanda, <coughs> Uganda, Thailand, and Brazil. <coughs> Many people reacted to this news with great concern. Will there be meticulous review by research ethics committees in these countries? Uh, will it be possible to get adequate informed consent? Is the motivation not really to reduce the costs of developing by exploiting people in developing countries to develop products intended only for the more lucrative marketplaces of developed countries? Now, these are the sorts of questions that this announcement brought out. They were asked at various meetings. They were asked in letters to the editors of newspapers and also of professional scientific journals. It was concerns of these types that prompted SIOMS, uh, which is an acronym for the Council of International Organizations of Medical Sciences, to undertake a complete revision of its international ethical guidelines for research involving human subjects. I had the great privilege of serving as the co-chairman of the steering committee for this project. Now, time doesn't permit a complete discussion of this 60-page document. So I'm only going to mention a few of the highlights that seem relevant to our considerations here. Uh, now, the first and most important problem we ran into was the conflict between ethical universalism and ethical pluralism. The position of universalism holds that ethical principles are universal and that ethics are the same in all societies and in all historical periods. In this view, ethical principles are out there waiting to be discovered. The only reason they seem to change with time is that we, as human beings, are getting closer and closer to uh, perceiving the true uh, ethical principles. Now, pluralism, in striking contrast, recognizes the fact that ethical principles develop as a consequence of conversations held within particular societies, and that these conversations and the resulting principles necessarily reflect the traditions and the histories of these cultures. Pluralists recognize the inevitability as well as the legitimacy of differences in ethics across cultures. Now this debate, which has been a matter of great interest to theoreticians for at least 2,500 years, uh, was moved into the practical arena as we began to consider international ethical guidelines. As many of you must have noticed, uh, the debate is no longer confined to technical journals of philosophy. In recent years, it's featured regularly in such periodicals as the New England Journal of Medicine. You also probably noticed that in this debate, the pluralists often refer to the universalists as ethical imperialists, and the universalists call their adversaries the ethical relativists. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the field will recognize that each of these names is intended to be insulting. <laughs> That is, uh, uh, many of the participants in this debate have uh, descended to name-calling. <clears throat> now, the revised CIOMS guidelines reflect a compromise. Some ethical standards are reflected as universal. For example, uh, there is a strict prohibition of deliberate infliction of harm on persons without justification. But the guidelines also recognize the legitimacy of some degree of ethical pluralism within specified limits. For example, there are cultures in the world where, where the concept of informed consent, so highly valued in Western civilization, is utterly devoid of meaning. The guidelines recognize this. Safeguards are built in to require consent unless it is virtually impossible. It can't be skipped merely because it's difficult or inconvenient. 
Now, to quote from the guidelines, all reasonable efforts should be made to obtain individual informed consent. When individuals are not sufficiently aware of the implications to give consent, the decision should be elicited through a reliable intermediary such as trusted, such as a trusted community leader. Now, whether or not they can consent, all individuals must be given full information. The one non-negotiable requirement is that each individual must be assured freedom to refuse or to withdraw. Now, this uh, is written into the guidelines with full awareness of the writers that in many tribal cultures around the world, exercise of one's freedom to refuse to participate in a project that the tribe or the community has decided to participate in is literally unthinkable. The consequence of such refusal would be, uh, well, I think the only Western equivalent I can think of would be excommunication, that you would be considered a non-person. Uh, next. Now, further from these revised guidelines, and I'll quote again, in some cultures, women's rights to self-determination are not acknowledged. Such women should not be deprived of chances to receive investigational therapies when there are no better alternatives. Efforts must be made to let them decide, even though the formal consent must be obtained from another person, usually a man. Now, as a further safeguard in situations like this, the guidelines propose that the information should be presented by a woman who is sensitive to culture-specific cues. In this way, we hope and believe that they might be able to truly discern whether the woman really wants to accept the investigational therapy. There were some people in the process of developing these guidelines that said, no, you should refuse any cooperation with any society that will not allow women to uh, give con informed consent on their own behalf. And our reaction was that we would just be accomplishing a double evil. First, it's not likely that we would uh, achieve the laudable goal of uh, enfranchisement of women in these cultures through our guidelines. And secondly, if we uh, remained aloof from them, the only real consequence was, would be that the woman would likely die because she was deprived of the chance to accept uh, this investigational drug. Now, in these guidelines, there are uh, statements made about the involvement of pregnant and nursing women. In general, the guidelines state that such women are not suitable candidates for randomized clinical trials and other types of clinical research. However, they would be considered uh, suitable candidates for clinical trials designed to respond to the health needs of such women or their fetuses or nursing infants. For example, and this was specified in the guidelines, uh, a clinical trial designed to evaluate a drug for reducing perinatal transmission of HIV infection. Now, anyone who owns a television set must know that this is an issue that's become very interesting to the media within the last two weeks. I'm talking specifically about the placebo-controlled trials of AZT that are being conducted in several developing countries uh, in projects that are uh, paid for by the, federal, the U.S. federal government. And I hope we'll have some time to discuss that in a little while. Another example that was specified in the guidelines was a device for detecting fetal abnormalities or therapies for conditions associated with or aggravated by pregnancy, such as nausea and vomiting during the first trimester, such as hypertension, and such as diabetes. There is also a provision in these guidelines for making expanded access or treatment IND use available to pregnant women. Now, I said I'd have something to say about the problem of exploitation. And the problem of exploitation is addressed at great length in these guidelines. Uh, it's particularly addressed uh, in the context of research being conducted by agencies 
in a technologically developed country and then carried out in a technologically developing country. There is concern, for example, and there certainly have been instances in the past where uh, the sponsoring agencies in developed countries would take advantage of the less well-developed uh, systems for protection of human subjects in the developing countries to develop, for example, Me Too antihypertensive drugs for marketing in developed countries. What the guidelines have to say on this point is that the ethical standards applied should be no less exacting than if the research were carried out in the country of the sponsoring agent. The goals of the research should be, and I quote, responsive to the health needs and priorities of the host country. This too is intended to reduce the likelihood of exploitation. Now further on the business of externally sponsored research, there are statements made on uh, the use of research ethics committees. Uh, the United States is the only country that has institutional review boards. In the rest of the world, except Canada, these are called research ethics committees. Canada, being close to the US as it is, calls them research ethics boards, which puts them between the two uh, terms. Now, what these guidelines recognize is that these review committees in, what in, the, initiate, in the developed country may be better at some things, and the review committees in the developing country, which the guidelines call the host country, may be better at some other, other things. And so they offer the option of dividing up the responsibilities. First, uh, in the country of the sponsoring agency, uh, there would be primary responsibility for certain criteria that can be regarded as more or less universal. So, for example, they would be held accountable for assuring the scientific soundness of the research and for reviewing the safety of any drugs or vaccines or other things that might be tested. And in addition, the committees in the uh, sponsoring country would be held accountable for seeing to it that there was no violation in principle of ethical standards. Now the committee in the host country would be primarily responsible for determining the responsiveness of the research to the priorities of the host country and for details of uh, the things I've listed on this slide. In the realm of informed consent, we're not looking for mere translation. We're looking for attempts to convey the meaning of the consent situation into the language of the host country. Our IRB has a uh, tradition that goes back for about uh, 20 years now when we want to assure ourselves that a consent form is being translated accurately, we give it to a translator to translate it into a language and then have that translator given, give it to another translator and have that one translated back into English. And we try to see if it comes out looking like it went in. We had one experience where we did that uh, with translation into an Asian language where it went in saying you will be uh, assigned to receive one, uh, one or the other of these two therapies by a process called randomization. And then it came out into English having passed through Vietnamese uh, saying you will be assigned to receive one of these two therapies by a process called chaos. Now, <laughs> when I say I don't want mere translation, this is the sort of problem that I'm referring to. Another thing that the uh, committees in the host country will have to be attentive to are the use of uh, monetary inducements or any material inducements. As you know, all of our ethical codes say there should not be undue inducements. None of them, of course, define what is a due inducement. And as we review uh, the gift exchange relationships in most of the world, 
uh, they're very, very different from what they are in the United States. I have sort of a fantasy of an American IRB reviewing research in Tokyo, uh, spending uh, its entire meeting trying to figure out whether the gift exchange tradition is another name for uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, so it's necessary to have local people who are, understand the culture determine whether the material inducements are, are suitable. Uh, finally, issues of privacy and confidentiality can only be understood in the, uh, in, by people who are familiar with the uh, culture of the host country or community. And for this reason, the uh, CIOMS guidelines say that the Research Ethics Committee in the host country should include persons who are thoroughly familiar with the customs and traditions of the community in which the research is to be conducted. Now, in this regard, it's vitally important to keep in mind that a culture is not the same as a nation. In many countries, particularly African and Asian countries, uh, Middle Eastern countries, the concept of nation is uh, seen as an artifact of European colonialism. So we should not necessarily look to the national health ministries for guidance on some of these topics. There is also in the CIOMS guideline a set of obligations for the sponsors of the research. These are set out as primarily prima facie obligations. <clears throat> a prima facie obligation is one that holds, unless you have a, an ethical obligation that overrides it uh, when there is a stronger obligation to do something else. It's not prima facie in the sense that you do this unless you'd rather do something else. Now, uh, these are also designed to minimize the possibility of exploitation. For example, any products that are developed as a consequence of conducting the research uh, should be made reasonably available to residents of the community in which the research is done. This would limit the possibilities of testing Me Too antihypertensives in developing countries so as uh, to get data to market them in developed countries. <clears throat> uh, if there's time later, I would like to tell the story of the development of eflornithine by the Marion Merrill Dow Company uh, for the treatment of uh, uh, trypanosoma rhodesiense. It's a form of sleeping sickness that occurs only in uh, small parts of Africa. And they were accused of using Africans so they could market this drug in Cincinnati. There's not an awful lot of this disease in Cincinnati. And that's a story that's worth hearing about. The sponsors are also expected to train and employ local personnel and to assist in the development of the developing countries' independent capabilities to perform ethical and scientific review. Uh, when indicated, they should make necessary health care facilities available. Uh, they should also provide free medical therapy and compensation for research-induced injury. And in the course of this project, it became clear to us that the only developed nation that does not provide compensation for research-induced injury was the United States. <clears throat> now, it's through statements of these types that the guidelines express the ideal that researchers from developed countries should attempt to leave the host country in an improved condition. There are also several passages in which the researchers are admonished to leave the host country no worse off as a consequence of their activities. In a sense, then, this is an application of the do no harm principle at the level of community as well as at the individual level. To summarize, the revised CIOMS guidelines stand firm on certain universal ethical principles while recognizing the legitimacy of some degree of ethical pluralism, but only within limits. Thank you very much.
Our next speaker will be Susan Alpert, PhD, MD. She is a director of the Office of Device Evaluation at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health from the Food and Drug Administration. ODE, or the Office of Device Evaluation, is responsible for the pre-market evaluation of the safety and effectiveness of medical devices. Dr. Alpert joined the FDA in 1987 as a medical officer in the Division of Anti-Effective Drug Products in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where she also served as a supervisor for anti-infective and dermatological drug products. Dr. Alpert received her AB in biology from Bernard College, Columbia University, and her PhD in medical microbiology from New York University School of Medicine. She earned her MD at the University of Miami School of Medicine, trained in pediatrics at Montefiore Hospital, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and completed her training in pediatric infectious diseases at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. as part of a joint program with the FDA. Today, Dr. Alpert will describe the FDA's role in patient and research subject protection, discuss foreign study requirements regarding human protection for FDA approval, and discuss parameters of FDA's new rule on waiver of informed consent. Dr. Alpert, we welcome you. So can, you, can you hear it? Good. Um, I'd like to speak from down here if that's OK. What I'd like to do, um, as was noted, to speak about a number of dis what sound like maybe disparate issues, all of which have as the focus the FDA's role in looking at the ethical way in which research is conducted uh, with an eye toward approval in the United States. Because after all, that is the role of the Food and Drug Administration is to focus on products entering the US marketplace. And I say that so that you'll understand that we have an impact on research, some research which is done exclusively in the United States, some research which is done exclusively outside of the United States, and some research which is done both internal to the United States and externally, including research that is done amongst the military. And I'm going to try to touch on all of those. And if I don't, I hope you will ask me some questions um, as, they, as they apply. In looking first, what is the FDA's role in looking at clinical research? We all recognize that our role is to look at the results of research and assess whether a product that is uh, seeking marketing authorization in the United States has been demonstrated to be reasonably safe and effective for its intended use. But the law actually provides additional roles for the Food and Drug Administration, particularly regarding the study of unapproved product with an eye toward patient protection. Our role is to look at patient protection. After all, we, other than the sponsor who has control over proprietary information, we are the only other organization that has access to that information, according to statute and therefore sit in a position of being able to look at the research that has been done on a product prior to clinical research and work with the sponsor to determine whether there's sufficient evidence that it will be reasonably appropriate to begin human research. That's our role, and therefore we sit in that, in that funny place um, in evaluating whether things are ready for human research in the United States. That's the role. For unapproved products, clearly there are two roles. There's one for uh, drugs and one for medical devices. I've separated them here because the rules that apply to marketed products are quite different in the device arena than they are in the drugs arena. And I didn't want you to leave the room without recognizing that there are, in fact, different regulatory authorities for drugs, for biologicals, and for medical devices. They don't pertain to human subject research, but they do pertain to what we see in the FDA prior to marketing. For example, in unapproved products, investigational new drug applications, INDs for drugs and biologics, are very comparable to the investigational device exemption. The language is a little different 
for medical devices. Both of them are the means by which we approve or disapprove the initiation of human clinical research in the US. When it comes to approved products, there is a distinct difference. In the medical device arena, any use of a product that is beyond labeled use, beyond labeled use, requires an investigational device exemption. In the drugs arena, the, there is a breadth of exemption for FDA oversight that relates to the safety exposure of the product. So that as an individual investigator, if you are investigating a, new, a drug within its approved dosages, you're likely to be waived from FDA review. In medical devices, since device and use are tightly tied, any use outside of the claimed use, the approved use on the labeling of the product must come under FDA oversight, with one exception, and that has to do with risk, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So what are our rules, whether it's under IND or IDE? What are the specific roles of the Food and Drug Administration? Who do we regulate and how? Well, generally, we regulate sponsors. The manufacturer, the person who wants to market the product, they are the primary individuals that we regulate. We regulate them in a couple of ways. One, they must submit their applications to us to get permission either to do studies or to market their products in the US. And we have authority to inspect them, inspect them both for the manufacturer of their product as well as through bioresearch monitoring their conduct of clinical trials. So we have that authority as well. We have specific authority and definitions of who an investigator is and what an IRB is also in the food and drug law. It's in different places in device and uh, drugs regulations, in different sections of the Code of Federal Regulations, but the issues are the same. We define who is considered an investigator, and if you meet that definition, if you are conducting trials that come under the auspices or the purview of the Food and Drug Administration, then you have obligations upon you regarding consent, regarding patients, regarding the care of patients, regarding information being fed back into both the sponsor of the investigation as well as to the Food and Drug Administration, to the government. So if you meet the definition, you not only have rights, you have obligations. Most of that is done via the sponsor. So for those of you who have been investigators and wondered why you didn't submit directly to us, it's because it's done through the sponsor of the particular trial. In general, that's the sponsor of the new product, the new drug, or the new medical device. They notify us who you are, give us your CVs, and your signed agreement to conduct the research according to the principles that we put or the obligations that we place on the sponsor as well as on you under the regulations. We also define what an institutional review board is. Dr. Levine mentioned that we are the only country that has really localized institutional review boards. They are defined in FDA regulation in terms of who sits on such a board and what the obligations of that board are. We have reporting authority and we have investigational re authority, inspectional authority for IRBs, just as we do for investigators. And under that same paradigm, that bioresearch monitoring, that monitoring is needed to assure the subjects of investigative research, that in fact that research is being conducted appropriately, safely for them, and with the right controls in place. Our focus today, however, is not just to talk, understand what the FDA's role is in, in oversight for research on products seeking marketing in the United States, but also to look at how we respond to the fact that research is a global entity these days, that research even on products um, which will be introduced into the United States marketplace, into our marketplace, are products that are being developed around the world, and that much of the research that we are seeing on those products has been conducted outside of the US. Well, there are appropriate statute and regulatory controls that define what is acceptable research from outside the US to support marketing in the United States. The goal here is to protect the American public. Again, the goal is to protect the American public and being sure that the products introduced for use here 
are reasonably safe and effective for their use here. So we have a subset of the research that Dr. Levine talked about. Not all of it, but a subset. And there are limits on what we can accept. One, we accept research if that research supports a product intended to enter our marketplace and that the data from that research is applicable to the United States. For example, research conducted in an environment, in a country, where the diagnosis of the disease is distinctly different, where the management of the patients outside of this particular product is distinctly different, may not be seen as applying to the way the product will perform, how safe and effective it will be for patients in the United States. So the research that we accept has to be applicable to the U.S. population. And it has to have been conducted under appropriate ethical guidelines, the focus we're talking about today. What do we consider ethical, appropriate ethical guidelines? Is it only what we do here? No. And in fact, it's very clearly laid out in the regulations that if it's conducted, if research is conducted in the United States, it has to follow our ethics. If it is conducted outside of the United States, the, the, the statement is that it must meet the requirements of the Declaration of Helsinki or the ethical requirements of the country in which the research is conducted, whichever is more stringent. So the goal is to be sure that we are applying appropriately stringent ethics to the protection of patients wherever they reside. And I think it speaks to the issue again that Dr. Levine pointed out, that not everyone shares the same ethical view of research and has the same threshold for how that research ought to be conducted. And we don't impose our decisions on other countries. Is an IND or IDE required to cover the research that comes into us from research conducted outside the United States? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. And it depends on the sponsor. If a sponsor is conducting research outside of the United States, we don't have authority over them. They may have an international company and be conducting that research as part of their work in another, in another uh, environment. And the Food and Drug Administration doesn't have control over that environment. However, if a sponsor wants to conduct their study and include, and include the sites for that study under their IND or IDE, under their investigational uh, paradigm with the Food and Drug Administration, then they have to meet the obligations of the IND or IDE. So we see some research supporting market entry for products in the U.S. that was conducted outside the U.S. without our oversight at all. We see some that was conducted in the U.S. exclusively and some where we're bringing together evidence from multiple types of studies. And they have to have met the ethics of the locations in which they are conducted under the appropriate rules of research where they are conducted and, again, be appropriate to the U.S. Is there other oversight? Absolutely. Again, we are only looking at that group of products that are intending to enter the U.S. marketplace or where the research is being done in the U.S. And the law doesn't provide different levels of threshold for evidence for products entering our marketplace or, being, uh, or where the research is going to be conducted in the United States. The only time we get into a distinction between, those, between the requirements is when we bow to the ethical controls in place in a foreign country. Because after all, each, each uh, jurisdiction has its own limits. We would not want another country to dictate what could be done here, nor do we dictate what can be done in another country as it affects their citizens, just as we don't want them to, to dictate what happens to citizens within the U.S. One of the issues that comes up as we look at the appropriateness of oversight and we look at whether consent must be obtained in every in every setting, or if there are settings in which consent may be waived for the individual. And I know you've, there's been some discussion today about minimal risk and the waiver of consent. I think one of the things we can't 
overlook is the fact that risk has a lot of definitions. And I've only put a couple of them up here. <coughs> definitions that we use within the FDA that are not the same definition. Minimal risk is defined in the common rule. And it's defined as risks faced in everyday, uh, in, in someone's everyday life. We also have another definition of risk. We talk about significant risk under the device regulatory authorities. In that environment, we are looking to differentiate between research that needs to be evaluated centrally by the, by the federal government, applications that need to come into the Food and Drug Administration, versus those where we can delegate oversight of that research to an, a local institutional review board. The term we use there is significant risk. And we define significant risk for that distinction, for that category of research where we believe the government, the central approval is necessary, as in, in essence, research where the failure of the product will cause mor morbidity, significant morbidity, or mortality, where we have a permanent implant and where the failure of the product is otherwise considered to be of monumental impact or significant risk to the individual patients in the trial. A little bit difficult to, to utilize, but the goal was to distinguish between research that be, can be controlled at the local institutional review board versus that which needs federal oversight. So we've, again, defined risk. We now have minimal risk, significant risk, non-significant risk, and although we don't use the word risk in the definition, reasonable safety and effectiveness is really an acceptable amount of risk for a product as it compares to the benefits of that product. The benefit risk ratio that is necessary to be in place in the right proportions to allow a product to enter the marketplace. So it'd be a lot easier if we only had one definition of risk, but risk is really something that, that has a lot of interpretations and has made one of our problems difficult. And the difficulty is the one we're talking about, and that is the issue of patient protection and informed consent. And when is it appropriate for someone other than the, pa the research subject, I won't call them patients, the research subject, to consent to their participation in research? We could spend the whole day talking about it. What I'd like to do is just tell you some of the consensus that have been reached under the auspices of the Food and Drug Administration and what answers we came up with in terms of how to implement our oversight for such research. First of all, we recognize the minimal risk definition as well, as do other government agencies, and consider it appropriate, not necessary, not required, but appropriate for some studies where there are no additional risks to the subject other than they would face in the standard conduct of their lives for individual consent to be waived. Secondly, there are situations when patients face emergency need for an unapproved product. Emergency need for an unapproved product when they are not in a situation where they can give consent to receive the investigational product. We call that emergency use in the device arena, and it requires the agreement of two independent physicians to determine that it's okay for the patient, in this case a patient, to receive an investigational product outside of the usual controls. That's an individual facing a life-threatening situation. They can't give consent. The product is not approved. They may have access to that product. But we also recognize the third instance. And that third instance was where there is a class of patients facing a significant risk, a risk of imminent or reasonably soon death, where there are no appropriate, adequate, well-recognized, well-accepted, sufficiently um, impacting therapies 
Patients are unconscious. They may not be in a situation where an appropriate, an appropriate surrogate is available to provide consent for them. And the research that's being done could have great benefit for them. What situation is that? Well, we see a lot of head trauma, for example, where patients present to healthcare situations. They're unconscious. They can't consent. You may not even know who they are. And research is being done to improve, in this country, the survival rates for patients with that type of injury. How do we study those new interventions? How do we determine when we have a new intervention to replace the old? How do we capture sufficient information on this new intervention in a way that allows us to make it more broadly available? The research needs to be done. And we determined that there are situations like that. Acute resuscitation is another one. Resuscitation that's necessary within the first five minutes of an event taking place, of a cardiac arrest, for example, where we all recognize that the success rates for today's interventions are, are less than 10%. That's not acceptable. We would like to develop newer interventions, interventions that can make a difference and save more lives appropriately. How do we capture the information on those interventions without organized research? Well, we felt we couldn't, and therefore put in place a, a regulation that allows waiver of consent for a class of patients where they meet those kinds of criteria. The patient can't consent because of the injury. That is the injury we are investigating. And there is no one who can appropriately consent, although they have been it, the, the physicians taking care of the patient, the investigators have attempted to identify such individuals. What we've put in place are, hopefully, the appropriate protections for a situation where we've waived consent. We've added things to try to provide other mechanisms than the individual's consent to tighten up the environment around that research and stay focused and keep it tight and keep it ethical and appropriate. And what's on this board is the list of things that we've done. The first is that we went through a rulemaking process. We made sure that people who were interested in this type of research had the opportunity to participate in the construction of this regulation and to comment on it as it moved forward. Secondly, as I said, the rule has tight limits. It's only useful in a very small number of situations, all of which need to be justified. Secondly, in general, research on unapproved products is done without making an announcement. The, the company who's doing it can keep that, that research quite secret. In this situation, that was felt inappropriate. They must disclose. They must tell the world they're doing the research, tell the community they're doing the research. The community needs to be consulted before the Institutional Re Review Board makes a determination as to whether this is appropriate research for the community whom they represent. There's notification if the study is approved that it's going to take place, where it's going to take place, and what kind of patients will be included in the research. The information is shared across the IRBs about questions raised and issues that impacted decision making for IRBs. There are reports that are necessary both back to the community as well as to the other uh, communities where the research is being done. And there will be reports and there will be oversight and investigation of the use of this rule. Again, it was felt to be necessary to forward research in a very narrow area, in the emergency research area, where we needed to develop organized data on new interventions. And we thought we would be able to do so only if we put in place additional controls. Where the patient can't consent, there needed to be additional controls. And we hope that we have accomplished that. Um, in closing, I'd like to say if you have any questions or issues regarding the, the Food and Drug Administration oversight of any research, we have, uh, in addition to uh, access through uh, the usual phone book, we have a website, www.fda.gov, um, which has listed on it many guidances 
It addresses the questions and the issues that I just talked about in the waiver of consent rule. It will list meetings that are coming up to deal with the issues of informed consent in different environments. And I urge you who are interested to, to occasionally drift by our website and, and visit us and participate in the meetings that are upcoming. There will be a meeting in September, particularly, particularly to address the rule on waiver of consent. Thank you. Our next speaker this afternoon will be Lieutenant Colonel Promotable Daniel Gordon. He is serving as the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research Associate Director for Overseas and Inter-Service Laboratory Plans and Operations. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon began his association with the U.S. Army in 1974 while an undergraduate at Southwestern Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, where he was a co-investigator on an Army grant to develop in vitro culture systems for malaria parasites. He attended the University of Texas Medical School at Houston, completed his internship and residency training in internal medicine at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon served for two years as a staff internist at Reynolds Army Community Hospital, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, returning to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 1984 to complete a formal infectious disease fellowship program and attain board certification in infectious diseases. While assigned to the Department of Immunology at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, he was involved in the DOD Malaria Vaccine Development Program, actively participating in the development, preclinical, and clinical testing of essentially all malaria vaccine candidates developed by this program from 1985 through 1994. This work involved numerous clinical trials conducted within the United States, Southeast Asia, South America, and Eastern Africa under more than 12 investigational new drug applications. From 1994 to 96, Lieutenant Colonel Gordon served as commander of the U.S. Army Medical Research Unit in Kenya, where he worked with the Kenya Medical Research Institute in establishing appropriate systems and procedures for conducting research involving human subjects. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon serves on several DOD and federal communities to include international community committees. Excuse me. He is a consultant to the UNDP, World Bank, WHO Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases. He's also a consultant to the Danish International Development Agency, the Commission on European Communities, and the WHO Tropical Disease Research Office for the Development of African Malaria Vaccine Testing Network. Today, Dr. Gordon will discuss Army regulations and the conduct of research in foreign countries. Welcome, Dr. Gordon. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can get all this high-fangled science and gear here. Um, I was originally asked to to provide a little bit of uh, uh, a practical approach to conducting clinical trials overseas, but after my tour overseas, I couldn't remember whether I was the person overseas or you folks were the folks overseas. Uh, so we've sort of changed this around to doing clinical trials in areas of endemic diseases. Um, the United States government, the DOD, does operate several medical research facilities around the world, and what I've done on this slide is uh, point out the places where the United States Army, as well as the Navy, have their research facilities. Uh, the Army has laboratories located in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Nairobi, Kenya, Bangkok, Thailand, and in Heidelberg, Germany. These three laboratories primarily emphasize work in tropical infectious diseases, whereas Heidelberg uh, emphasizes work in combat, the area of combat stress. Our uh, colleagues in the Navy operate research, uh, medical research facilities in Lima, Peru, Cairo, Egypt, and Jakarta, Indonesia. And again, these three areas, these three laboratories, uh, primarily, primarily emphasize research in tropical infectious diseases. Now, to put things in a little bit more of a perspective, uh, one of the major objectives of these overseas laboratories is to evaluate products, diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, 
or other interventions with the ultimate goal of getting these products licensed. Okay? Obviously, there is some additional work being done on disease processes, primarily in the area of epidemiology, looking for areas where there are uh, high incidence rates of certain diseases so that one can identify uh, appropriate test sites for these diagnostic tests, drugs, vaccines, what have you. But again, the, the key points here are in collecting additional information to support licensure through the FDA. Okay? This is one of the areas, i.e. protocol development, where we start dealing with some of the discrepancies that may exist between the standards of the sponsoring country and the, the host country, the country where the research is going to be uh, conducted. Uh, the majority of our studies are literally an extension of previous clinical trials, hence the addition of additional information. Uh, let's, for example, use examples of vaccine trials. Uh, there are various phases of testing that products frequently go through. Uh, phase one testing, one involves very small numbers of individuals. One tries to collect initial safety and reactogenicity data and immunogenicity data in the case of a vaccine product. Uh, there is a phase two in which one tries to collect additional safety and immunogenicity data, but collect uh, efficacy data. Uh, in some cases, when one has to depend upon experimental challenges or comparison to laboratory correlates of protection, some people make an arbitrary uh, distinction of calling this phase 2A. Uh, some of the limits of this type of data are the fact that with experimental challenge, you're frequently using, uh, for example, in the case of malaria parasites, parasites that have been cultured in vitro have been specifically selected to become high, to be highly infectious for mosquitoes. Uh, they're well characterized cloned parasites and may no longer represent the types of parasites one might come across in a more natural situation. It is in these phase two type trials in which one extends the study to collect additional safety and efficacy data as well as, uh, I'm sorry, efficacy data based on challenge under natural conditions. Um, conditions that are not typically present in the United States. Finally, phase three trials, you enlarge your studies even further, uh, and these are frequently what the FDA refers to as the pivotal trials for licensure. Phase four trials, which we occasionally get involved with, for example, post-marketing uh, surveillance studies uh, are conducted overseas, and I believe there's one being conducted in Thailand right now uh, for the hepatitis B vaccine. Okay. Protocol review process. How does this happen? In reality, um, when a protocol is developed, it is usually developed in collaboration with both the host country and the sponsoring country, host country scientists and sponsoring country scientists. Uh, once a reasonable protocol is developed, it is submitted for local scientific review within the, to a scientific review committee within the host country. Now, in areas where we have conducted studies in which they do not have scientific review committees, one of the things that we work on is helping them establish an appropriate scientific review committee, educate them to uh, this type of uh, review process. Uh, the scientific review in the host country is frequently done concurrently with a scientific review at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. So our studies typically undergo a minimum of two scientific review procedures. After a protocol has obtained scientific approval from both committees, the protocol is then forwarded to the local ethical review committee within the host country. Again, in countries where we have had, uh, we 
have not had the type of ethical review committees that we typically are used to in the United States. We work with those countries to help establish ethical review committees following fairly worldwide accepted guidelines. Once we get local ethical approval from the host country ethical review committee, then the protocols are forwarded onto the uh, Office of the Surgeon General's Human Subjects review, Research Review Board. It is not until all of these review processes are completed do the protocols progress any further. Now, the guidelines for the use of volunteers in subjects of research are outlined for the United States Army under Army Regulation 70-25. The most current effective version of this regulation became effective in February of 1990, and it essentially implements the Department of Defense Directive 3216.2 and reflects the present legal requirements pertaining to the use of human subjects as research subjects funded by research, development, test, and evaluation dollars. This regulation provides the Army policy on the conduct and management of human subjects in testing, including the command responsibilities, the review process requirements, approval authorities, and report reporting requirements for these studies. It also allows a decentralized <coughs> approval option for those elements that have established review committees and an internal review process. AR 70-25 also provides guidelines for the preparation of research protocols or test plans. In fact, there is a fairly well delineated format for these protocols. Now, frequently in some of these host countries, their formats are different than our formats. However, the majority of these formats have similar components. And if the components are there, whether a specific item is on page one or page three, isn't that critical. As long as the components are there, we usually can negotiate an acceptable format. Uh, AR 70-25 also specifies guidelines for human use committees. And it is uh, this regulation and these guidelines that our host countries really like to grasp onto as far as memberships for these committees, you know, the guidelines for functions and operations, guidelines for expedited review procedures, guidelines for the suspension or termination of specific, of approved research projects, and for record keeping. There is a fairly detailed section on the volunteer agreement affidavit or informed consent document. I'll go through this in a little more detail. These are the items that are specified. The title and location of the study. Most people would agree that that's important to have on the consent form. Who is the principal investigator? Who is conducting the study? A description of the study. And the description of the study must be a description that your volunteer can understand. What is the purpose of the study? Why is this person getting involved in the study? How long do you expect the individual to participate in the study? You have to identify any experimental procedures that the volunteer may be subjected to. And again, this must be clearly delineated to your potential volunteer. This is an important section that scientific and ethical review committees like to see overseas. They want to know about any other prior information, similar data, or related studies that provide the rationale for this study. In our case, that's fairly easy because we have already collected preliminary safety data on a lot of the products before they go overseas for further testing. We need to outline what the risks are. What are the risks that the volunteers are going to be exposed to by participating in the study? What are the risks of participation? What are the risks of, of taking an experimental drug, being part of a, a study to evaluate experimental vaccines? 
what if it's just a diagnostic kit? What are the risk, the reasonable risks that the volunteer is going to experience? What are the benefits the volunteer may expect to get from participating in the study? Are there benefits that the specific volunteer will receive? Are there benefits that the community will receive? Um, we look at both short-term benefits as well as long-term benefits. Again, this is an area that the host country ethical review committees as well as the sponsoring countries ethical review committees like to review. Um, sometimes you get some interesting discussions on what are reasonable benefits between ethical review committees in the United States and in the host countries. And I've got some interesting stories about that too. What alternative treatments are there uh, that the volunteer may uh, have options to? A section on confidentiality. To what degree will the volunteer's identity be held confidential? Under which conditions, under what conditions might the uh, volunteer's identity be disclosed? Who are the points of contact for the study? What if the volunteer has additional questions? Who can the volunteer get in touch with? What recourse does the volunteer have? Who can the volunteer go to if the volunteer has a concern, uh, and wants to go to somebody other than the principal investigator? One has to delineate the subject's rights fairly clearly. And we've heard of these a little earlier. Participation in the study is voluntary. Refusal to participate will involve no penalty or loss of benefits to which the subject is otherwise entitled. Furthermore, the subject may discontinue participation at any time, again, without penalty or loss of benefits to which the subject is otherwise entitled to. Our consent forms delineate the types of compensation, medical treatments that the volunteer is entitled to for injuries that are related to participation in the study. Those are the basic components of the volunteer agreement affidavit or consent form that is typically used in our studies conducted overseas. Additional pieces of information can be included when required. And this is the type of information that is sometimes included comments regarding the unforeseeable risks to the subject, embryos, or fetus, circumstances under which the subject's participation may be terminated by the investigator, what additional costs to the volunteer may result from participation, what procedures may be followed for the orderly end of the subject's participation, what if the patient is receiving, the volunteer is receiving an investigational drug and has an adverse event and is discontinued from the study. Well, you don't just drop the patient, say goodbye, and say thank you very much. You may want to follow this volunteer for extended periods of time to make sure that they are not suffering additional side effects. In those sorts of cases, you know, the volunteer has to realize that he, may have to, he or she may have to come back for additional visits uh, for their own safety. Uh, procedures for notifying volunteers of new data which could affect the subject's willingness to continue participation in a specific study. These types of information may be included in the uh, informed consent. And then if, if photographs or uh, videotapes or things like that are being taken, uh, information needs to be included regarding how this material is going to be handled. How do we typically go about obtaining consent? We usually start large and work small. We start out typically at the community level. We work with either large villages or large catchment areas. We go out and disseminate information about our program. We our overseas laboratories have typically been in areas in existence for 15, 20 years. Our names are fairly well known. Uh, we disseminate in information through local village workers that either Walter Reed or the organization is going to be conducting a study of such and so. We'll have a town meeting to explain the generalities of a clinical trial. If the village, if the head leader, the village leader, the people involved in general are 
further interested in potentially participating in a study, they are invited to attend additional meetings where the studies are discussed. Uh, I should mention that at a lot of these town meetings, uh, printed information is also disseminated, printed information in the language that they can understand. Um, after that phase, they're invited to, to have to attend additional meetings, usually at a local health facility, a relatively non-threatening type of situation. Uh, this is one of the facilities we use in western Kenya. Uh, it's on the property of the Serenity Rural Health uh, Project. Volunteers come in. Uh, they have the opportunity to meet in larger groups and again hear more and more about specific protocols. Eventually, however, it does come down to a sit-down, face-to-face discussion with the principal investigator. Now, frequently, these face-to-face -face discussions will include friends and family members of the volunteer, as well as a translator, or another member of our community. Now, the objective here is to try and meet a balance. One, so you, you want to make sure that your volunteer has an opportunity to ask questions, but is not intimidated by, you know, a one-to-one -one meeting with just one individual. If the volunteer is more comfortable having a friend or family member, friend or family member is more than welcome to attend. Uh, the importance, though, is having a right mix of people so that you're comfortable, that the volunteer understands what the study is about and has the opportunity to ask questions without being impeded by the presence of other individuals. That basically concludes the summary I have for the type of research we do, how we accomplish the type of research we do, and I would now like to sort of open this up to uh, discussions. Thank you very much. You would move to the microphone and uh, ask your questions. Dr. Kent. Dr. Alpert. In the context of the new emergency approval process, what is the FDA's definition of a community? That's a really important question. Um, the definition of community is one that we struggled with um, because when we identified, for example, example, a catchment area for a, for a hospital, it's quite different in the kind of community I grew up in, which is a farming community in Connecticut, in rural Connecticut that doesn't have its own hospital, versus a hospital in the, in the middle of New York City where the catchment area is very hard to define. Um, what, we, what we intend, and we haven't defined specifically because it can't be defined by us, um, is guidance to the IRB as to who they need to reach out to for community consultation. Who do they see as the community they serve? And what are the appropriate ways for them to reach out? We've tried to keep the doors open and not limit whether a, a community uses a community meeting, which works in some situations, whether they use radio, television, and newspapers as identifiers of, of uh, access to information on the trial. Um, we've tried to be as open as we can without, without limitations because you've hit the nail on the head. That's a real hard thing to define as you look across the U.S. I just wanted to make a comment uh, seconding uh, Dan's uh, presentation on uh, how he educates the local community to ethical practices involving human subjects. Um, I wish Dr. Pellegrino uh, were here right now because several years ago I attended a transcultural dimensions in medical ethics uh, meeting that he uh, held down at the National Academy of Sciences. And one of the speakers who talked about the ethical practices in Africa, and his topic was about American imperialism in Africa. In the introductory part of his lecture, he showed the ethical principles that he holds uh, in, in, in the African community. And the slide that he showed in the bottom corner of the slide was a DOD reference number. Uh, indicating that, in fact, a study that the DOD had conducted in, in Africa was the source of his ethical principles. <laughs> While everybody's thinking, I'll exercise my privilege to ask a question. And uh, we're going to have to wrap it up because we're 
take about five more minutes. But um, and I think this may go more to Dr. Uh, Levine. Um, when it is impossible to meet us. <laughs> <laughs> when it is impossible to provide. <laughs> When it is impossible to meet the standard of medical care available in the U.S. in a foreign country, is it ethical to conduct greater than minimalist research when the research may have some benefit to the local population? For example, expensive AIDS drugs treatments that may prolong life are not affordable and not even available in some countries. Can we conduct AIDS research when we do not make the U.S. standard of care available? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. That question couldn't be any better if I'd planted it. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, well, first I want to say that when you're talking about evaluation of drugs that are believed to be effective for the treatment of a certain condition, you can't apply the concept of minimal risk to the drug itself. The concept of minimal risk was developed only for the evaluation of procedures that, in the language of the regulations, do not hold out the prospect of direct benefit. This distinction is most clearly developed in the regulations for research involving children. When you're evaluating the procedures that do not hold out the prospect of direct benefit, the threshold standard is minimal risk. But when, and then you can go to minor increases above minimal risk if there's certain sorts of more stringent justifications. In the category of procedures that do hold out the prospect of direct benefit, if you examine that category, there are no threshold standards. You justify the risk the same way you do in medical practice, that uh, you hope that there will be a corresponding benefit to the individual subject that will outweigh or somehow be greater than the risk that, you in, that you're imposing. Now, the remainder of the question is very relevant to the current uh, concern about the conduct of uh, placebo-controlled trials of ACT in pregnant women in various uh, what we call developing countries. Uh, the issue has been raised, mostly in the uh, newspapers and on television, that we already know that AZT is effective in reducing the vertical transmission of HIV from mother to fetus. Uh, how then can we justify doing such trials in Thailand and in sub-Saharan Africa? The regimen that was evaluated by ACTG, the AIDS Clinical Trial Group, <coughs> uh, evaluated a prolonged course of AZT and compared it with placebo. The so-called Protocol 076 regimen that now has become standard uh, in the United States is prohibitively expensive. Uh, one of the responses to the complaints comes from a physician in Uganda who points out that the per capita health budget, annual health budget in his country is under $2 US per year. And it costs a lot more than that to pay for the 076 regimen of AZT. Now what the trials are uh, doing is comparing a much shorter course of a much lower dose of AZT with placebo. The standard of care in the countries in which these studies are being carried out is that there would be no antiretroviral treatment at all because the only levels of antiretroviral treatment that they could afford uh, are prohibitively expensive. And we have been advised that in the countries in which this placebo-controlled trial of a short-term low-dose ACT is being carried out, that the World Health Organization has made a commitment to help finance this uh, form of preventive therapy for vertical transmission 
in case it is demonstrated as safe and effective. And this is the basis for this justification. Uh, that's about all I want to say about it. Is there some part of your question I left out? Oh, good. Thank you. A uh, question for Dr. Alpert. Uh, with the community consultation, if I may make a reference to my own presentation, uh, is, does the FDA foresee the possibility that the consultation would result in the IRB saying, due to the consultation itself, this is either not good research to do in this community because there's so much opposition, or alternately that the protocol should be changed or modified to meet the uh, concerns of the community consultation? I think both of those would apply. It was, in fact, our expectation that there will be um, those situations in which after community consultation, the IRB says this community d will, not, will not be an appropriate place to conduct this research. Um, the second is something that happens with IRBs across the country, that certain, con certain aspects of the trial may need to be uh, modified or documents may be modified or reporting may be modified to meet a particular uh, a particular community's needs. Um, so we really expected both, but more of the former, where after community consultations, it will be clear to the IRB that it would not, that the community feels the research is inappropriate for them. I'd like to add to that. Uh, I think I'm the one who's responsible for introducing the concept of community consultation into the public discussion of research on human subjects uh, in a paper I wrote uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, community consultation is conceived of as an active engagement of a community. It was never conceived of as the FDA has, uh, uh, has conceived it or not conceived it in its uh, regulation on this topic. The community in question was to be was to consist of people who met the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the proposed clinical trial. It was also to include other persons who are members of the intended beneficiary population. So for example, we all know that even though drugs are evaluated in populations that are very rigorously defined, once the clinical trial has been completed, you then include all the other patients who have the same diagnosis. We intended to include those people. Another important modification of this community consultation idea was in recognition of the great problem that clinical trials had with so-called communities in the evaluation of the early retroviral drugs for HIV infection. Uh, it became very clear that the community was protesting features of the clinical trial that were design issues, scientific design issues, not merely informed consent and things of that sort. So at that time, I collaborated in writing the AMFAR consensus development document uh, on conducting clinical trials in community settings to say that this community consultation must take place at a time when the scientific design of the trial has not been frozen. The IRB doesn't get to see a clinical trial until it's too late. You've already got the design and you let the IRB tinker with the consent form and things like that, but you don't let them meddle with the design or you'll ruin the clinical trial. But we intended to have the community involved in deciding whether this should be placebo controlled or particularly problematic in the early antiretroviral trials was the requirements that you take no drugs except those that are prescribed within the protocol. All we did with that is to drive other drug taking underground. Everybody was surreptitiously taking their compound Q and their dextran and their heroin, and so on. So what we said is make a deal with the community. And what we came out with in that setting was allow this extracurricular drug taking. Just so long as we know who's taking what, we can then begin to detect drug-drug interactions and so on. Now FDA has come along, and I'm delighted that they want the community involved, 
But we're now dealing almost exclusively with communities that can't be found. I mean, you're, the example you get, gave, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Where do we find a community of people who are the intended beneficiaries of this research? This is what has de made it depart from preconceived notions of community consultation. That's exactly right, and that's why we included in our definition the community of potential patients, because this, this research, this waiver, is very limited. And it's limited when you can't prospectively describe the individuals who would otherwise come into the clinical trial and who could, in fact, consent prior to needing the, the intervention under study. And we recognized, and it is, it is a bit of a, of a conundrum for us to try to figure out how to reach the community. And what we determined is if you can identify individuals, as, as Dr. Levine just said, who are, in fact, the potential targets for the research, then you do that. But what we're saying is that we are all the potential targets if we live in the catchment area for some of this research. You can't tell who amongst us will have a cardiac arrest or a, or a car accident with head trauma. And so we have defined community slightly differently. Yeah, with all due respect. <laughs> you can see we and, don't exactly agree. And, and with a uh, preface that you didn't write the regulations, so you can't be held accountable for it. <laughs> if, if something like what you just said had been published in the supplementary information, that would have been enormously helpful to people on IRBs. But I'm sorry to say that the official word out of Rockville has been no statement at all. And it's been, again, the issue was, and, and I, since Dr. Levine said we're not, we didn't write the rules or the comments, um, but I did participate in the development of the regulation, and I can um, say that he's absolutely right, that there needs to be more information. We are, in fact, developing more guidance for IRBs, and as I mentioned when I spoke, there will be a meeting in the end of September to provide an avenue for more discussion of how to implement this rule. It is very tricky, it is very difficult, um, but we, we chose not to delineate things too carefully, figuring we would get it wrong. And we need to have some experience and develop the, the right tools to uh, do the outreach. But it is a very challenging area. Uh, when we have taken the step to say that there is an appropriate way to waive individual consent, that's crossed a line that had not been crossed before, and we need to develop the right tools with the right oversight to see that we can, in fact, progress and allow the research to take place that needs to and provide the best protections in that setting that we can for the individuals who will be subject of that research.